Originally, as best we can tell, this was upland pastures for the Humphrey family. My dad used to ride his horse all up through here, and this was, of course, all open land. And, and he loved it and had a dream of having some land up, up, up here of his own. And finally, in 1939, having just been married to my mom, he got word that uh, um, the Humphrey widow, and I think I have this story right, uh, the Humphrey widow, um, who was, I guess, pretty sick in bed, um, she agreed to sell him um, the bulk of what is now Tanager Hill, something on the order of 75 acres. And uh, so he invited my mom um, on a picnic, and he proceeded to tell her that, um, that he had just been given permission to buy the land. And he, of course, was very excited. And, and uh, as they were sitting there having their picnic, uh, there's an apple tree right there, which is still there now, um, and a scarlet tanager came and landed in the tree and proceeded to serenade them. And uh, that became the inspiration of the name uh, Tanager Hill. You know, what, what are some of the features on Tanager Hill that are of, of interest? Um, one of them for me has been, or, or elements of it for me, have been those features that relate to, uh, to the glacial past here. And of particular interest to me is um, the sort of medium ridge that runs through the property from north to south um, at sort of a uh, stair step below the ridge. And um, as an armchair uh, glacial geologist, my belief is that that is a lateral moraine um, left as a remnant of the departing glaciers um, in the Farmington River Valley. And if you think of the glaciers as sort of a conveyor belt, um, they're constantly conveying um, rocks and stones and gravel and sand and, and sediment with them and then depositing them at, their, at the end and at the sides. And when it's being deposited at the sides, that's called a lateral moraine. Where Lucy's Brook comes through these sediments here, you can see off in the background where erosion has, has exposed those sediments. And those sediments are what is known as undifferentiated till, which is to say that they are composed of, of clay and sand and silt and gravel and pebbles and rocks and stones and, and uh, all mixed together in no particular order um, and without any sorting. Um, and one of the ways that that would happen is in the case of a, a lateral moraine that red layer above the stone and gravel, that is a compacted clay layer. And that would have been deposited in the bottom of this, this lake that was here. As the brook eroded its way through the moraine, thus creating the gorge, um, it's allowed the water to begin to cut back through those same sediments. And that's what that clay layer is. Of interest has, uh, to me, and I think maybe to others, is the, the question of the intersection of, of man and nature on this property. This property would have been farmed and it would have been heavily grazed um, in, uh, in the 18, 1800s and, and, and beyond, probably up until about 1910 or 20. As we all know, um, New England grows rocks and um, so the farmers uh, would have been grazing cattle and, and sheep and whatnot in here, and as a result of that disturbed ground and, and frost heaving, there would have been a lot of rocks that would have come to the surface. So every spring, um, you know, the advantage of having big colonial families was they'd all come out with the wagon and the horses and they'd, they'd go through the field and they'd pick up all the rocks. And they would take them and they would dump them in some place uh, uh, that was either useful or where they could be put out of, out of place. And this field um, has a lot of evidence of that. There are some rocks left in it, of course, some of the bigger ones, but um, off to the perimeter on the downhill side, there are large piles of rocks.
Then there's also the question of there are several ponds here and um, the, the question becomes that of are these ponds man-made or were they um, glacial features? The, the one pictured here, um, there's debate as to whether this was a man-made pond um, or whether it was a kettle hole. Um, if it were a kettle hole, that would have been a glacial feature. It also could be that that hole was um, a natural kettle hole, uh, but then subsequently enhanced by a farmer um, to produce uh, water for, um, for farm animals. This is, the, this is our family's favorite apple tree, um, and a great testimony to the will to survive. Uh, I can't exactly gauge how old this tree would be, but if you judge by the bottom of the trunk, you know, it's a good two feet in diameter or more. That's a very old tree. It's completely hollow inside. You can stand up inside it. But yet, it, is, it still has one strong leader that is desperately turning out apples. And it's, it is prodigious in the number of apples that it produces. And they, they are delicious apples. There are times of the year when the apples are beginning to fall that you'll just see deer out here under the tree. They'll stand on their hind legs to, to reach as high as they can to get the ones still on the tree. And, uh, and the tree very often is just bright red with these apples. It's, it's pretty cool. You know, part of the history of this piece of property, um, which is kind of fun, is the the period of time, and this would have been um, sort of leading up to the eight, you know, 1850 or so, which was the advent of the, the Bessemer process for making steel. Prior to that time, um, the manufacture of steel required a means to get carbon into, um, into the steel. And the way they did that was um, through the introduction of charcoal. So there was a thriving industry in, in New England um, to harvest um, wood of all kinds, uh, chunk it up into um, larger than cordwood style st uh, size, uh, put it in these large, large piles, cover it with dirt and sod and mud and all that, and then they would burn it. And they would burn it in such a way that um, they would create charcoal. The colliers, who were the charcoal burners, um, would make these big flat platforms. I'm standing on one now. A big round um, circular flat area and that is where they would bring all the wood um, and pile it up. And there are, there are several of these on the property. Now for the uh, colliers or the charcoal burners, it was not a particularly glorious life. They would work weeks to assemble one of these big piles. If you were to scuff through the grass here and into the soil, you'd find that the soil is very black and that's uh, left over from the charcoal burning process. Wildlife, as you might imagine, plays a prominent role um, at Tanager Hill and, uh, you know, just about everything that you can imagine we have um, seen or experienced up here. Um, obviously, deer uh, are they're just all over the place. Bears, mountain lion, believe it or not, have been up here. I woke up one morning to find a young bull moose looking in our kitchen window. You know, bobcat all over the place, obviously turkeys, coyotes are numerous, um, on and on and on. I'm Sally Rieger and I'm a board member of Simsbury Land Trust and I chair the stewardship committee for the Land Trust. I'm also involved with the Lower Farmington River Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic Study. I've been involved with that since April of 2007. And that was the um, brainchild of the Farmington River Watershed Association with which, with which I work. So I, there are three conservation organizations that are local that I'm involved with. Tanager Hill property is a very important, important property to the Simsbury Land Trust. For one thing, it's a very, very beautiful, large property with a mix of forest and grassland. And one of the things that the Land Trust tries to do is to protect some of the landscapes that are 
the beautiful signature landscapes of the town of Simsbury, and this is certainly one of them. But it's important for other reasons also. Its ecological value is enhanced by the fact that it is contiguous to the land trust Owen Mortimer property, and that property abuts town property. The um, Tanager Hill property, if the land trust is fortunate enough to acquire it, that property abuts Penwood State Forest, so it makes a very large, contiguous, open space, natural area with the diversity of forest land, um, stream, pond and lake, and grassland. And grassland on the Tanager Hill property is especially important in Connecticut because that's a type of habitat that is in decline in Connecticut, returning to forest or development. To preserve certain grassland species, you need to have the grassland, the grassland available. And thinking about the interests of a group like the Lower Farmington and Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic Study, water quality is one of the things that both the study group and the Farmington River Watershed Association care about very much. If Tanager Hill were developed and there were houses and roads in there, there would be a lot more surface that can't absorb water and let the water run through the ground and filter. As it is, the water in Lucy Brook on Tanager Hill runs down into a wetland. It is pretty clean water because it comes out of the pond called Lake Louise at Penwood and has no significant development along it. So it goes into the wetland and then infiltrates into the river and is a good source of clean water um, for the river, which is important both to the Watershed Association and it's important to, to the study. Um, the biodiversity aspect of the property is enhanced by the variety of habitats and also by the fact that it's such part of such a large contiguous area of natural of natural habitat so that you can expect to find forest interior species you can expect to find edge species and grassland species there'll be vernal pool species on that um, tanager hill property because it does have a couple of vernal pools so it's really an exceptional piece of property in in many different ways I'm Don Rieger. I uh, work on trails, hiking trails for the Simsbury Land Trust. Tanager Hill has existing trails on the property, wonderful trails, that will be very welcome to the walking public uh, in Simsbury. What the Land Trust would do with those is we would need to create a map uh, so that people can find their way around, blaze the trails in different colors so people know where they are on the landscape. Also, we would create a couple of new trails connecting the Tanager Hill trails to the existing land trust trail on the Owen Mortimer property, the land trust property next door. Perhaps most important in the new trail connection is we'd create a trail connecting Tanager Hill with the uh, top of the ridge at Penwood State Park. This would create a trail connecting the New England Trail, the National Scenic Trail, uh, with this trail system and thus with the floor of the Farmington Valley. And this is kind of the holy grail that people hiking people have wanted uh, for us to, to find. Now, the hiking trails need to be maintained. We have uh, various land trust property stewards and other volunteers who work on this. We can remove the occasional branch or limb that comes down, cut back the, uh, the brush. Some of the trails at Tanager Hill are grassy, so we'll need to have those mowed. That will have to contract out with somebody. And and that raises another issue, that is the trails have to coexist with the natural habitat. So while we'll do some mowing for some of the trails, we'll probably not mow the meadows uh, at the same time because we want to preserve those for grassland birds. Uh, we want the public to use the trails, to be welcome there, enjoy it thoroughly, but we need to manage the whole business in a way that is consistent with our mission to conserve the land and to provide habitat for, for wildlife. The pastures that we are in right now, um, these would have been um, grazed by the original owner up, up until 
you know, probably 19, I don't know exactly, but 19, 20, 25, 30, something like that. The cows would eat what they want to eat, and they would leave behind all kinds of things, um, such as cedars, birches, black birches. And by the time my, my folks bought this property in 1939, um, succession was already pretty much beginning to do its thing in these fields. And there were a lot of young cedars and birches. And by about the early 60s, um, the forest was really reclaiming these pastures completely. Um, to take a walk through here was, you know, there was very little open land left. Um, so my dad had, um, had somebody come in here and cl clear this in an attempt to get this back to um, the pastures as they would have been actively um, used in the, let's say, 1880s, 1890s, that kind of thing. So, um, and it has been a labor of love since then to, to sustain that um, with a, uh, an annual mowing program. Well, of course, with a property this size, the stewardship task, the trail stewardship task, is a pretty big one. Uh, there's a, a lot of mowing, there's the power line cut where we have an existing trail that, would, that needs to be mowed. So it's, it's an expensive business and the land trust will need to be very wise in marshalling its resources, saving money, putting it aside for years to come to assure that we, we do the right thing by this property. So we want, we want the trails, of course, to be as good a route as people can have from downtown Simsbury all the way up to Penwood and the National Scenic Trail. And so one of the new trails we would create would go through the woods towards the bottom of the property and connect with Owen Mortimer. So people could walk from the, uh, the Flower Bridge part of uh, Simsbury and get in the woods pretty much right away on East Weetog Street and not walk on the road. We'd have a trail through the woods that would provide the safest and most enjoyable a walking route from Simsbury to the top of the ridge. My name is Claire Kane. I'm the Trail Stewardship Director for the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. And CFPA manages 825 miles of hiking trails across the state of Connecticut. Um, everything from short loop trails to longer linear trails that offer multiple day um, hiking adventures. So we work regularly with our local partners and landowners to preserve the trails so they're on the landscape uh, you know, forever and we are really interested in connections to local communities, um, connected open space, and creating a recreational system that will be around for a long time and offer the folks of Connecticut a great outdoor recreational opportunity free of charge and um, a great way to experience the wild lands and woodlands of Connecticut. The Tanninger Hill property is so valuable and so special because it is part of a, a contiguous open space on the western side of the Metacomet Ridge. I mean, not only does it connect to Penwood State Park, it connects to existing land trust property and this piece would just expand that green corridor um, for animal migration, bird migration. Uh, you know, it's, it's really a block of protected land um, that is really rare in such a developed part of the state. You know, we really feel like this property is, is such an important link between Pen Penwood State Park and downtown Simsbury. Being able to connect the Farmington River, which is, you know, wonderful and scenic and special in, in all of its own ways, to a property like Tanger Hill and then on to a property like Penwood is really fantastic and really rare. I mean, it's very rare that you're able to actually connect from the valley to the top of the ridge and a hiker can experience all the zones in between that they might cross on the way. And, you know, even beyond downtown Simsbury, being able to connect west to, you know, through six other towns, being able to link state forests and state parks along the way, the trail really becomes this thread connecting open space and special areas that not many people get to visit or enjoy. And having them all connected along 
one trail. It's almost like a, you know, a string of pearls all the way out to the Appalachian Trail. So we expect it will be you know, approximately 40 miles of linear trail, and it's just really going to be fantastic when we can stitch it all together. And this first piece, Tanger Hill, is you know, really the keystone to the success of the whole project. CFPA really finds our partnership with uh, local land trusts like the Simsbury Land Trust really valuable. I mean, I don't think we could accomplish, um, you know, the conservation priorities that we have for the state without the support and assistance of land trusts that really are invested in their local communities, that really understand um, the important treasured lands that need to be protected right in their hometowns. And, you know, we're very focused um, at a statewide level on trails and forest conservation, and we really can't accomplish our goals without the support of local groups who really are connected uh, to the land in their hometown. You know, the Tanger Hill property is a, a perfect example of what we want to achieve. We want to build a lot of support locally for the property. We want folks to be able to enjoy it and learn more about the natural and geologic history of the area that's so special. And you know, partnering where we can put in a trail and the property can be preserved by the land trust, it's a really nice uh, kind of wedding of uh, two groups who really want to accomplish the same thing. and create a space that is open for folks to enjoy and really appreciate uh, the natural world that's around us um, that's really been untouched and is remarkable in so many ways. My dad was a great um, conservationist and been very active with the, with the land trust and with, uh, he was a founder of the Farmington River Watershed. Um, talk at Mountain Forest Protective Association and uh, Connecticut Forest and Parks and numerous other um, uh, conservation organizations. And it had always been his dream and my mom's dream and um, I think by DNA his kid's dream that this land could um, um, remain in a, in a natural state and be enjoyed by generations uh, to come. So that, that sort of leads to why our interest in, in uh, finding a way for the land trust to own it. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.